السلام علیکم اسٹوڈینٹس ٹاپک آف ٹوڈیز ڈسکشن از نویئر اسٹاکس اکویشن سو وی ہیو آلریڈی ڈسکس اباؤٹ کوشز اکویشن کوشز اکویشن ہیو ٹوٹل ٹین ان نونس اینڈ وی ہیو ڈسکس سو فار ون کنٹینیوٹی اکویشن اینڈ دے آر تھری اکویشنس of uh, Cauchy's equation. So we need constitutive equations to solve Cauchy's equation. So what does this constitutive equation do? They, these equations enable us to write the components of the stress tensor in terms of the velocity field and pressure field. We will discuss the two cases. One case is fluid at rest and another case is when fluid is moving. For the case of fluid at rest, the first thing is we need to separate the pressure stresses and the viscous stresses. If you remember this stress tensor, the diagonal components are the pressure stresses and off diagonal components are the viscous stresses. When the fluid is at rest, the only stress acting at any surface of any fluid element is the local hydrostatic pressure which is being shown here in the figure. Now this pressure is always acting normal to the surface and always acting inward. When the fluid is at rest, there is going to be no viscous stresses, so the stress tensor becomes this, what is being shown here. Off diagonal component is going to be zero, and the diagonal components is only going to have pressure. Negative sign indicates here the direction that it is acting inward. Now this hydrostatic pressure is same as thermodynamic pressure and this thermodynamic pressure is related to temperature and density through some type of equation of state. For example, one equation of state that we have discussed is P is equal to rho RT. P is equal to rho RT. Now pressure is related with density and temperature. Now if the density is constant, then the flow is going to be incompressible flow. If the density is varying, then the flow is going to be a compressible flow. With the change in temperature, the pressure is going to change as it is being clear from the equation P is equal to rho RT. With the increase in temperature, pressure is going to increase. With the decrease in temperature, pressure is going to decrease. So, what we intend to do is we intend to reduce the number of unknowns. When we use this ideal gas equation, what we are doing essentially, we are increasing the number of variables. For example, we have brought in temperature here. Which is another unknown. To solve this unknown, we need to bring in another equation. And one equation we have discussed already is the energy equation. For the sake of simplicity here, 
we are going to assume that temperature is constant or in other words uh, we are assuming isothermal process next thing is the density again for the sake of simplicity we are going to assume that density is constant or in other words the flow is incompressible so while we are trying to drive or we are trying to reduce the number of unknowns we are making two assumptions one density is constant flow is incompressible and flow is isothermal so for the uh, when the fluid is at rest the stresses is only going to have pressure stresses which is hydrostatic pressure when the fluid is moving then we need to separate these two stresses pressure stresses and the viscous stresses so what is being done here we separated the stresses into hydrostatic pressure and deviatoric stress tensor now this deviatoric stress tensor is nothing but we subtract hydrostatic pressure from our stress tensor now you know already that this of diagonal components are the viscous stresses what about the diagonal components now now you know when we were discussing about flow in pipes when the fluid is moving there is not only hydrostatic pressure but there is going to be dynamic pressure as well so in that case the deviatoric stress tensor the diagonal components are going to have dynamic pressure so what we have done now is we have just uh, separated pressure stresses and deviatoric stress tensor uh, uh, the viscous stresses but have we solved our problem earlier we had 10 unknowns we have 6 unknowns of stress tensor but now we have basically 7 unknowns we have increased the number of unknowns So to reduce the unknown, we need to bring in constitutive equations so that we can express uh, shear stresses or the viscous stresses in terms of velocity field and any other measurable fluid quantity or property such as viscosity. To do this, we have learned in solid mechanics. the relation between stress and strain in our case it is going to be stress is equal to some kind of constant times strain which is epsilon now we are making another assumption that the constant here is the viscosity So, so far we have made three assumptions. One, the flow is incompressible. Second, flow is isothermal. And third one, it has constant viscosity. Now, fluids, rheology is being discussed already in the class there can be four kind of fluids there can be newtonian and there can be non-newtonian non-newtonian shear thickening fluid shear thinning fluid 
and Bingham plastic. We have discussed this already in the class, so I'm not going to go through it. But we are here focusing on Newtonian fluid, where the shear stress is directly related with shear strain rate, with some kind of constant. And here we are assuming that viscosity is constant. So I just repeat again. We have made different assumptions to reduce the number of unknown. One thing we have assumed incompressibility, isothermal, constant viscosity, and we are limiting our discussions to Newtonian fluid only, where there is a direct relation between shear stress and shear strain rate. Now strain, you all know it is basically a change in volume per unit volume or if I draw a volume here, for example, like this. Whenever there is some kind of deformation, so I say like this part is being deforming, it is going to move in U, in X, it is going to move in Z, and it is going to move in Y. To drag this deformation, if we can find out change in velocity with respect to uh, with respect to the axis, we can find out strain rate. These strain rates are discussed or explained in detail in other kinematic description in section 4.4, and you can go and uh, and see that section. So these are the strain relation that we find epsilon xx become du over dx epsilon yy become dv over dy epsilon zz becomes d w over dz where u is related to x v is related to y and w is related to z for sigma xy here u and v are changing with respect to the uh, coordinates and this is the relation that we obtained. To see the relation of where it came from, you need to go to section 4.4 to understand this. It is not in the scope of this presentation, so I am not discussing it here. So ta ij is basically this. And it can be written in terms of velocity field, which is being shown here uh, in this matrix. So we plug in this value into our stress tensor. And this is the stress tensor, which is the sum of hydrostatic pressure and deviatoric stress tensor. And this deviatoric stress tensor is now written in terms of velocity field. And the stress is written in terms of velocity field and pressure field. So earlier we had 10 unknowns. Now we have reduced this to only 4 unknowns. 1 unknown pressure and 3 unknown velocities. Now, we go back to the Cauchy's equation. We have already driven Cauchy's equation and Cauchy's equation was basically sum of forces, sum of body forces and surface forces equal to that relation that we have obtained from Reynolds transfer theorem. 
when we had done the summation of body forces and surface forces this is the relation that we have found Now this relation is true when the density is variable. If you go back to our lecture about Cauchy's equation, I was discussing about that with the, uh, the with the change in mass distribution, with the change in density, the forces are going to change. Now for the derivation of Navier-Stokes equation, we have assumed that flow is incompressible or in other words, density is not changing. So we just go back to the Newton second law, which is F is equal to MA and acceleration is basically dV over dt, where d is the material derivative. It means that velocity is going to change in time and it is going to change in space. So summation of forces is equal to MA or is equal or in other words it is M dV over dt. Now if you look at here I have kept mass constant because we have assumed density as constant. So it becomes mass is rho dv which is being shown here. Now this equation that part which was the summation of body forces and uh, surface forces becomes this rho dv over dt minus rho g minus del dou sigma ij whole into dv integral over cv is equal to zero for this relation to be true that integrand has to be equal to zero what is being done here and this negative value when it goes to the other side it becomes positive so this is the alternative form of Cauchy's equation rho dv over dt where d is the material derivative is equal to rho g plus del dot sigma ij now we can write this Cauchy's equation in the component form as it is being shown here Coming back to the uh, stress tensor, so sigma ij is basically this, x component of Cauchy's equation is being written here, rho d u over dt is equal to rho g x plus d sigma x x over d x plus d sigma y x over d y plus d sigma z x over d z. Now sigma x x is basically sum of these two negative p plus 2 mu du over dx when we apply this into here this is what we get negative dp over dx plus 2 mu d squared u over dx squared. The second part is d sigma y x over dy which is basically equal to 0 plus this. And that one is being shown here. Sigma zx is going to be 0 plus this part and that is being shown here.
Now, as long as the velocity components are smooth functions of x, y, and z, the order of differentiation is irrelevant. We have discussed about the smooth function. The smooth functions are the one which are differentiable. As far as I remember, we have drawn one function in the class like this. Now this particular function at the top of a, you can see the hill where the point is that point it is not differentiable it means it's not a smooth function for a smooth function it has to be differentiable at every point <coughs> so as long as the velocity components are smooth functions of x y and z mean in all three directions the order of differentiation is irrelevant for example, if you look at this part here, mu do, mu d over dz, d w over dx, which is being written here, it can be written as this, mu d over dx, d w over dz. The result is going to be same. So we apply this into the equation, for example, in this one, and we write for components. <coughs> this is the relation that we get. So here, what I have done is that we have done some rearrangements, and then we further rearrange it so that we can use incompressible continuity equation and you know incompressible continuation is equal to zero so it simplifies and the x component becomes this now this part is being simplified using Laplacian operator which is being shown here. So Laplacian operator del squared is equal to d squared over dx squared plus d squared over dy squared plus d squared over dz squared. We apply it here so it becomes mu del squared times u. So the x component becomes rho du over dt is equal to negative dp over dx plus rho gx plus mu and this. We can draw analogy to write y component and z component. In the compact form, incompressible Navier-Stokes equation becomes this, rho dv over dt is equal to del p plus rho g plus mu del squared v. So this is the incompressible form of Navier-Stokes equation. You can write this equation again in the component form which is being shown here. I would recommend you to write this compact form into the component form in the Cartesian coordinates and if you cannot do it, please discuss with me.
and I will be happy to explain it to you. Now if you look at these, these equations, they are four unknowns. There are three unknown velocities, u, v, and w, and there is pressure. And we have three equations of a nervous stroke equation. So we need another equation so that we can solve that problem. That fourth equation is going to be the continuity equation. So this is the equation, Navier-Stokes equation in the compact form. This equation is named in honor of French engineer Louis Marie Henry Navier and the English mathematician Sir George Gabriel Stokes. They both developed this equation independently and then this equation was named after them. Now this equation looks harmless, like it has nothing, you just need three velocity components and pressure and you can couple this with the continuity equation to solve it. It looks quite harmless. But if you pay attention, this equation is a unsteady equation dv over dt it is non-linear and it is second order partial differential equation now many researchers have spent their entire careers trying to solve the Navier-Stokes equation uh, uh, and this is the fundamental equation in, uh, in fluid dynamics, I must say. But remember, the equation that we have driven is being driven using some, uh, some assumptions. Incompressibility, isothermal, constant viscosity. If we assume compressibility, then this Navier-Stokes equation is going to change. If we are going to assume that the flow uh, is not isothermal, then we have to bring in energy equation. If we assume viscosity is not constant, then we have to de derive over stress tensor or over viscous stress stresses again. So these assumptions just make our life easy. In reality, does viscosity remains constant? It's highly unlikely because viscosity changes with temperature. Viscosity can change. Viscosity is, remember, it is internal resistance to flow. So, when it starts to flow, the viscosity is different, and when it is flowing, the viscosity changes. So, to use this Navier-Stokes equation, we use piecewise linearity concept. We have discussed piecewise linearity concept in the class that we can simulate a non-linear behavior for by choosing small segments which are linear so this is the assumption that we used to solve Navier-Stokes equation that viscosity is piecewise linear nevertheless I finished the presentation here for Navier-Stokes equation Feel free to ask me any questions.
and thanks a lot for your time. Allah Hafiz.